Well, one interesting thing about the algorithms that predict future behavior and psychological traits or intimate traits of people is that, you know, people often think, oh my God, this is science fiction, you know, like how could that be? Or they say, oh my God, this is totally impossible. Now, it's in fact pretty intuitive. Look, if you know someone pretty well, you will be able to predict their future behavior. You, even if you don't know exactly whether, you know, they read a given book or not, you're reading this book now and you think, oh my God, you know, the friend of mine, you know, the one that is, you know, so well organized and always talks about, you know, this given thing, he or she would really love this book. What you made here, you made a prediction, right? You know your friend, you know their psychological traits, you know their, some of their intimate traits, and it allows you to extrapolate from the knowledge you have about the friend into new areas. You basically see a new book or see a new play or hear about a new activity and you can predict which one of your friends would like it. Now, computers, basically computer algorithms do exactly the same thing. They would take a set of behaviors that a given person has expressed in the past, now match it with behavior of many other people that the algorithm has in its database and then say, hey, you know, people who read these books or people who listen to this type of music or people who visit these websites, they also tend to vote conservative or, you know, uh, study psychology or work as accountants. So now we can basically just make those very simple predictions. Um, when I said simple, but then on a large scale, they basically become very powerful a lot of signal that is useful for an algorithm would not be useful for a human being. Let me give you an example. If I tell you the politicians that, you know, I like, you would have no trouble figuring out what my political views are. Perhaps even if I gave you, you know, 10 of my favorite books, it would be still informative to you as a human being, you know, okay, so people who read those books, you know, they tend to have this political leaning or this religious leaning and so on. But now if I told you, uh, look, those are, you know, the 10, uh, you know, games I played recently, or this is the brand of the shoes that I'm wearing. Now, as a human being, you'll be like, yeah, like, it's probably not very revealing about your political views or religiosity, uh, simply because it's kind of difficult for us to match a brand of the shoe or a game with particular uh, ideology or worldview. Now, the fact that it's difficult for us to see the link, it doesn't mean that the link doesn't exist, right? The link could be there, it just could be subtle enough to fall below our threshold of perception. Now, a computer has a big advantage here. It can store and process way more data that, than humans can in terms of links in the relationships like that. So it might be that when you look at a huge database of millions of other people, it might be that people who wear, wear a given brand of shoes, they have a slight liberal or conservative leaning, something that would be imperceptible for humans. For a computer, it's a useful bit of information. A useful bit of information that is not conclusive, but now if you add up thousands or millions of little crumbs of inconclusive information like that, you can in fact arrive at the very accurate profile. To answer this question, we collected a lot of digital footprints and we used Facebook as our research environment. We asked people to share with us their Facebook likes and Facebook status updates. And then we also asked the same participants to feel uh, in questionnaires, personality questionnaires, IQ questionnaires, happiness questionnaires, um, and so on. And then we build machine learning models that would predict the scores of these people on these questionnaires from the digital footprints. And once we've done that, we would take a group of new participants that the algorithm has never seen before, and we would try to predict their scores on self-reported questionnaires, which we use to measure the accuracy uh, of uh, the algorithmic approach to measuring your psychological traits. And it turns out that uh, those methods are very highly accurate. Uh, to give you an example, um, 
we compared the accuracy of these algorithms, of the algorithms based on Facebook likes, with the accuracy of human judges. We would give questionnaires, personality questionnaire in this case, to friends and family members of our participants, and would ask them to fill in those questionnaires in the name of the participant, right? So basically based on their acquaintance with the participant, they were supposed to answer the questionnaire in their names, in their name. So then what you would get, you would get basically personality scores of the participants uh, as predicted by their friends and family members. And then on the other hand, we had their scores as predicted by the computer algorithm based on their Facebook likes. And now we could compare how many, how many likes do you need to be as accurate as a given friend or a family member. And what we found is that you need only 10 likes. You need to give algorithm only 10 likes for the algorithm to be as accurate as your work colleague. You need around 100 likes for the algorithm to be as accurate when predicting your personality as your uh, family member, like brother or mother would be. And finally, you need around 200 likes to beat the most accurate of human judges, your own spouse. So in the past, if I wanted to know your political views, either I needed to basically become close with you and you know, have you share those views with me, though we know that even close friends very often do not discuss uh, certain uh, ideas and do not share all of the information, all of their intimate traits uh, with each other. Now, I could also give you a questionnaire in the past and ask you, hey, can you please fill this questionnaire? And you had full control over, hey, whether you are actually going to respond to this questionnaire or not. And if you decided to respond to a questionnaire, you still had a choice of not answering the questions honestly, which basically means that you had full control, one can say, or, or a large degree of control over your intimate traits that you did not want to share with the others. Now, if I can make the same predictions, if I can predict your intimate traits, such as your political views, sexual orientation, religiosity, personality, intelligence, or whether your parents were divorced or not, if I can predict all of those things by simply providing an algorithm with the list of songs that you have listened to, or the list of websites that you have visited in uh, recent hours or, or days, uh, this basically means that we are heading towards the post-privacy era, a time where uh, people will not have rights to privacy. When I started studying these algorithms, I was mostly focused on the downside. I thought it was uh, very scary that uh, you can have a computer algorithm that takes seemingly innocent and seemingly uninformative piece of data, such as your playlist on Spotify or a bunch of Facebook likes, and can extrapolate from this data to make very accurate predictions about your intimate traits, such as your political views, religiosity, sexual orientation, personality, IQ, and so on. This was pretty... Uh, scary for me. I did, not expect, I did not expect the algorithms to be as accurate. I thought, well, there'll be some accuracy, but we quick, quickly learned that the accuracy of the algorithms is higher than what people could achieve, uh, and it's also higher than what could be done with questioners, especially in terms of traits that people are not really happy to share with the others. Like, you know, you don't really share your political views or your sexual orientation with people that you don't uh, know really well. Uh, and I think it only came later, it appeared later to me that, you know, there are risks there, uh, but there are also tremendous opportunities, let's say, to make the world a safer and more fair place, as in, you know, matching people with better jobs, or let's say monitoring their psychological health and extending those benefits to people who are traditionally deprived of it. Well, I think that people are really willing to share the data and give up the data simply because it's really beneficial to us. Right? Think about Google Maps. 
It's an amazing tool that helps us to get from point A to point B in the shortest possible time and while burning least fuel. It's amazing both on the personal level but also on the society level. We, we're saving a lot of hours and a lot of gallons of fuel, which is also great for environment and so on. Now, for Google Maps to work, what basically needs to happen is that you can use it to find your way to work, but you can also, you have to share the information about how you were driving around with the platform, because then the platform can use this data that it collected from you to optimize the routes for other people, right? So I think there's no going back from, uh, 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 from here. People get so much in return for sharing the data that it's unlikely that it will be now willing to give up Google, Google Maps, Facebook, Amazon Kindle, Netflix, and all of the other platforms that basically make, make our lives easier, safer, more interesting, fulfilling, uh, and so on. Well, I think we certainly need good legislation and good technology to help us to maintain as much privacy as possible. But I think that in the long term, uh, the game here is lost. We, uh, the sooner we accept that we are heading towards the future without privacy, the sooner we can focus on trying to organize the societies and organize the policies, technology, and even cultures in such a way as to accommodate the world without privacy. To a large extent, is it, it is an uncharted uh, territory. What in the past required huge institutions spying on people, trying to predict their intimate traits, keeping tabs on them, required enormous amount of effort, money, and men uh, power. Today, the same thing can be achieved uh, you know, by a guy in a dorm room with a laptop and internet connection and you know, a few hundred dollars to spend on you know, databases that can be purchased on uh, official or unofficial uh, data markets, which basically completely uh, changes the game. And I think that the sooner the people accept the fact that basically there's no privacy going forward, uh, the safer uh, the society will become. The sooner you realize that whatever you write in your email can be read by motivated others, the sooner that we all realize that being an atheist or being gay or being liberal or conservative is something that basically people will know about, well, they could probably very easily infer it now and definitely would just get easier in the future, the sooner we can focus on making societies more tolerant and open-minded, uh, educating uh, the voters to, uh, be, uh, uh, to make them more difficult to manipulate, uh, and basically organizing the societies and preparing them for post-privacy era.